it's really lovely to have this opportunity to talk to you, especially without having to travel. Um, so many times I've uh, flown across and uh, uh, to Ireland and got back in the day, and it's quite an arduous day doing the whole thing there and back and speaking. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, I uh, first let me put my uh, slides up so I can uh, share them with you. I, I, I spent a while thinking about uh, what global citizenship means now. Um, my work in the past has been, uh, well, it started off looking at health inequalities um, and trying to understand what the main drivers were of the huge differences in life expectancy between different social classes. Um, and then developed from that and looking at uh, the effects of income inequality. Um, and uh, I, I'm a bit worried when someone says I have a background in uh, economics because I don't really. Uh, indeed, I think of economics as almost as a mental illness, um, <laughs> as some people understand it. Uh, I, I, that's not to say there aren't some extremely sane economists, um, uh, e ecological economists, for, for instance. Um, what I want to do, though, is to go through just reminding people really of, of the obvious, the, the big problems uh, that uh, our societies have to deal with now, which I think provide the sort of underpinnings of, uh, of what it means to be a global citizen. Um, so I, I'm just going to give you reminders of these big problems here, the military expenditure, the climate crisis, uh, COVID, and probably more pandemics to follow, uh, the problem of refugees and displaced people, the huge flows of population now, uh, and then uh, all the problems of, of tax. Um, well, I, I actually don't know about all the problems of tax, um, but I do know a little bit about uh, the extraordinary levels of tax avoidance. Um, but just to start with reminding you of the, the scale of military expenditure, which in a way shows how our societies um, face uh, international relations armed to the teeth, uh, spending these huge sums um, on, on defense, on weapons of mass slaughter. Um, uh, the total there, um, note actually this, this uh, pie chart is 2019, but that total military expenditure I have on the left is um, uh, the, the next year. I put that up because two trillion is a rounder number, easier for us to remember. Uh, I don't think people realize that the, the USA is far and away uh, the biggest, uh, has the biggest uh, military expenditure. Um, you see uh, the UK, um, uh, I, sorry, I should have uh, checked that Ireland was there. Um, it's not, presumably, because you're spending only a small amount, as you should be, much better than these others. But when we think about uh, US uh, military expenditure, we normally, I think, imagine USA, uh, Russia, and China. But actually, Russia and China are tiny compared to USA. So um, that just a reminder of the scale of, uh, of uh, this and how, how it is symbolic of how we face other nations. Um, the next big problem uh, is, of course, um, uh, the problems of uh, the climate crisis. Um, and it's, of course, not only um, global warming, um, but uh, um, storms and droughts and um, floods and uh, uh, sea level rises and um, uh, changes in the acidity of the sea, um, a, a huge host of problems. Uh, I want to show you these different things or remind you of them just because they're all problems that affect everyone in the world. They're huge problems that can only be solved by international cooperation. 
Um, and of course, the, the climate crisis uh, endangers us with more uh, conflict. Um, apparently, of the uh, 20 countries most vulnerable to climate change, 12 of them are mired in conflict. And things like water shortages and um, whether people are taking too much from any of the great rivers that flow through several countries, um, those sorts of things uh, lead to, to conflict, but also the streams of refugees and people who can no longer carry on uh, uh, traditional agriculture and uh, having to leave their homes for reasons like that. Um, I, I think it's important at the same time to remember and if you look as here, this is rather out of date. Um, uh, we, I think we put this in our spirit level book, but um, it might have been in a, a paper then. Uh, at CO2 emissions per head uh, of, in each country and life expectancy, you see that um, after you see that world average CO2 emissions, that vertical line, most of the rich developed countries are the wrong side of that line and it doesn't gain them any extra life expectancy. And if instead of life expectancy, I have had happiness or me measures of well-being, the picture would be very largely the same. Um, and note that there are countries that um, uh, achieve high life expectancy uh, without um, uh, um, high levels of CO2 emissions. And that is on existing, or, or actually as this is an old graph, uh, past technology. So, you know, even with the, uh, our very polluting technology, it was possible to achieve high levels of happiness, well-being, life expectancy, um, with much, much lower levels of um, uh, CO2 emissions. I think that's really important to remember. And if we uh, move to um, abandon fossil fuels and make all the other changes we need to, uh, it should be a, possible to move well down uh, near, a, uh, near the, the zero um, emissions. The co problem of COVID all over the world, these are the cases um, uh, in uh, 2020, um, and uh, um, it, it's not just going to be COVID that spreads throughout the world. And in fact, we're very lucky that COVID had such low um, mortality rates. My my daughter was in uh, uh, Sierra Leone during uh, doing work on the Ebola epidemic. And of course, the, the case fatality rates were hugely much higher. And the danger is that we will get new diseases um, and uh, uh, with much higher fatality rates. And the only way of dealing with them, with them is of course, uh, um, vaccination and uh, cures that are shared worldwide. Um, we know we're going to get new variants that will challenge the vaccinations we've got uh, simply because we haven't shared those um, the vaccines uh, sufficiently widely on a large enough scale. So, you know, this is a problem that, de again, demands international cooperation in a, a quite unprecedented way. Um, this uh, shows you the percent of the populations of the world that are, of different countries that have had um, large numbers of um, the population immunized. And you see uh, the whole of Africa, almost the whole of Africa with those very low levels of, of immunization um, and uh, other countries with low levels will be generating um, new problems for us, you know, any view of enlightened self-interest means we must share these things. We must act together globally. 
refugees, um, I didn't know quite how to illustrate this, but I found this, this graph. Um, I don't think people are aware of the scale of the problem of, of refugees. And this isn't all displaced people. Uh, but if you think of 30 million refugees, usually living in pretty awful conditions, and the, the problems that this causes in the reaction of the host populations, and the tiny influx of refugees into European countries um, has quite changed the politics of those countries. Uh, led to racism and the far right and so on, raising its head. Um, so, you know, these are they're huge challenges to, to all of us. And again, we have to think on a global scale, but some of these, uh, these problems are importantly driven uh, by uh, the um, climate crisis. Uh, I wanted also to remind you in terms of the, the means of dealing with these problems, our need for funds to deal with them uh, globally, uh, the scale at which the super rich and big corporations manage to avoid paying tax. Um, those estimates, they're very rough estimates. Um, they come from uh, Nicholas Shackson, who is uh, uh, the Tax Justice Network. Um, and uh, uh, you see my comparisons, those figures of the scale of tax avoidance, uh, are four times the English uh, NHS expenditure and twice the military expenditure of China each year. So that's just to give you an idea of the scale of, of uh, the funds that are, are getting lost to governments that could be used to solve some of these problems. Um, and uh, well, I, I'm, I'll leave that slide there. Um, but, we face all these problems, these huge global problems, as if we were still uh, self-sufficient nations of self-sufficient peasant farmers. Uh, but in the last generation, in my lifetime, we've moved from being those kinds of societies um, uh, to uh, systems of global interdependence. Um, I remember um, the sort of agriculture around us when I was a child. I've seen in, in, in France in the 70s, I remember uh, people plowing with wooden plow and oxen um, and markets which where people took their ducklings and their rabbits and uh, um, vegetables to sell uh, and all that. You know, we it, it's now if it, those exist at all, it's just for uh, largely for tourism. But uh, our world has changed beyond belief. Everything we had for breakfast probably comes from other countries, and of course, I'm speaking with technology um, made the other side of the world, um, and so we we have become a global species dependent on people the other side of the world. And yet, I think our politicians uh, ha have forgotten that, you know, this isn't 1821 or 1921, it is 2021. Uh, and yet, they're still facing world problems uh, as, as if this world interdependence just wasn't, wasn't true. I want, though, to point out now that our attitudes to other countries, uh, to each other through this global interdependence uh, is substantially affected by the nature of social relations within our societies. Uh, you can see here uh, this, um, uh, again, very old uh, data, I'm afraid, but it, it shows the um, gradient of mortality 
uh, across our society in, in many, uh, well, all just about all societies have these patterns of health inequalities. Ireland has uh, big ones and so do we and Americans even bigger. Uh, some of the European countries, uh, North Europeans, a bit smaller. Um, but this pattern of gradient, uh, of, of a social gradient in mortality that is to do with class and status um, uh, is an indication of how the, the society we live in uh, determines the extent to which it determines our lives. Um, and if you look at the inequalities between the rich developed countries rather than within them, you find it has virtually no effect on our death rates. Um, uh, you see some of those countries have almost twice as much income as others, um, and yet uh, it's not, it doesn't seem to affect um, uh, life expectancy. Uh, so what goes on within societies is, is extremely important, and it doesn't just determine our life expectancy, it, it, it affects our social relations and our view of other people, other countries. Um, so uh, basically uh, what I was trying to say there, inequality within countries has a substantial attitudes on shaping, uh, 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 influence on shaping attitudes to other countries, to whether a country tends more to international cooperation or competition and to the frequency of uh, conflict. I'm going to show you the evidence behind that state, uh, uh, statement. But first, I want to point out that people misunderstand what inequality does to us, the inequality within our societies, uh, the social hierarchy, the class differences, um, the importance of social status. They think it only matters if it creates um, absolute poverty or people think it's terribly unfair. But actually, it creates a social relationship between superior and inferior. So we see people as superior or inferior. It creates that hierarchy. Um, uh, and so in a way, we should think of inequality as a social relationship. Um, and as such, it increases status competition and status insecurity. It increases anxieties about self-worth. It intensifies worries about how we're seen and judged by other people, um, and whether we're, we worry about whether people see us as attractive or unattractive, clever or stupid, um, interesting or boring, all those sorts of things. It, it increases the value, evaluative way we, in which we judge each other. Um, from superior to inferior. Um, in our spirit level book, we put together data on how countries uh, do in terms of these uh, things listed on the left there, life expectancy, kids' maths and literacy scores, uh, you know, from the OECD piece of data, uh, infant mortality rates, homicide rates, imprisonment, that's the proportion of the population in prison, teenage births, how much people feel they can trust others, obesity rates, mental illness, um, and uh, figures on social mobility. All those are quite strongly related to uh, the scale of inequality in a country. They all get worse uh, when the gap between rich and poor is bigger. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. So USA, Portugal, UK um, have uh, worse outcomes on all those kinds of things than the more equal countries, uh, the Scandinavian countries and, and Japan when, when we did this work. Of course, countries have been changing their inequalities over time. Unfortunately, uh, most have increased their inequalities. Um, uh, it's not so just these uh, items here that and uh, I, I was worried that people would think we'd chosen these items just to prove our point. But uh, actually, if you look at the, for instance, the UNICEF index of child well-being, which uh, 
It's a quite different index. It's made up of, I think, 40 different components. So whether kids can talk to their parents, whether there's bullying at school, what child immunization rates are like, all that goes into it. Here, low scores are bad. In the last one, high scores were bad. So what you're seeing is the more unequal countries, again, USA, Portugal, USA particularly, are doing uh, particularly badly in terms of child well-being and all those things I, I've just shown you. So uh, I'm trying to hurry through this evidence that uh, more unequal countries with those bigger gaps between rich and poor do worse on a whole range of, of uh, social and health outcomes. Um, and actually, there is now evidence from, I think, well, this is uh, four papers, but uh, I think there are now five that show uh, that the experience of COVID was worse, higher death rates and so on in more unequal countries. But the point I was I made earlier that more unequal countries the inequality uh, affects social relationships our relationships with each other and how we treat other human beings uh, more widely internationally I think uh, the next few graphs are perhaps quite important for making that point this is the result of what they call a lost wallets experiment where um, wallets are, um, are left and uh, the question is are they returned by people who pick them up thinking they're accidentally lost and you see in the more unequal countries on the right um, uh, only about 20 percent of them come back whereas in the more equal countries on the top left there, 80% of them come back. Um, and that is a profound indication of, I think, different social relationships, even with people you've never come across or met. Um, imprisonment rates are much higher in more unequal countries. Uh, on the left there, you've got the number of prisoners per 100,000. Note that it's a log scale. Um, and the differences go from about 40 per um, 100,000 uh, population to over 10 times that level. Uh, so this again shows that in more unequal societies, people treat other people more harshly. Uh, this is really telling us that the um, criminal justice system becomes more punitive. It's affected a little bit by more crime, but most of it, most of this relationship reflects a more punitive um, penal system, um, longer sentences, harsher sentences, so on. Um, you know, sent to prison for longer, more um, for, for less serious offences in more unequal countries. Um, I want now to give you uh, a little picture uh, of how inequality affects the way we relate to each other, uh, uh, other aspects of the way we, re we relate to each other. So this is civic participation whether people are involved in local community life, know their neighbors, uh, do voluntary work, all that kind of thing. Um, and you see uh, this measure of civic participation shows participation is lower um, in more unequal countries. Uh, that's been, uh, in most of these things I'm showing you, have been replicated uh, quite a number of times. Um, people also trust each other less. Um, these uh, the more unequal countries on the right, uh, <clears throat> fewer people feel uh, most people can be trusted. This is the percentage of the population who agree that most people can be trusted. We repeated all this work, uh, not just on these rich developed countries, but on the 50 um, American states. 
asking just the same question, whether the states with the bigger income differences within them do worse on these things. And the picture is very substantially the same. Uh, so uh, people in the more unequal American states trust each other much less. There is now a paper showing that um, uh, people are less willing to help each other in more unequal societies, uh, less willing to help the disabled or the elderly. So really profound effects on how we treat each other. Um, uh, I haven't shown that graph for a very long time. I'd forgotten I had it, um, but I, I dug it out. Um, this is the percent of the population who agree that they would do better than average in a fight. People are sort of almost gung-ho for a fight. Um, and it's a, an extraordinary measure. Um, and, you know, through my, um, well, since my teens, the number of people who have, uh, who now learn martial arts of different kinds, um, it, it's just extraordinary uh, how, how that has changed. Homicide rates. Um, have gone up, uh, sorry, uh, 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 closely related to inequality. Um, we don't know what the lag periods are between a rise in inequality and uh, uh, a change in, in um, a homicide, but these are American states and the blue triangles are Canadian provinces. Um, the scale of the differences, homicides per million people, you know, the blue triangles, the Canadian provinces, they're around, what, 15 homicides per million people. And the more unequal of American states, it goes up to 150, a tenfold difference in the homicide rates. There must be 50 or 60 papers in the peer-reviewed journals showing those relationships in different countries uh, all around the world. You know, a really consistent relationship. And yet... You know, uh, last night on, on the Channel 4 News, there was an item on knife crime in London, all the stabbings, uh, not mentioned the relationship between, with inequality. If you go and look at much more unequal countries, you see things have got much worse, much more unequal than those uh, that bunch of rich developed countries I've been showing you. We gave some lectures in, in Mexico and uh, the huge inequality is much bigger than the USA or Britain. Um, people are not, they're, they're, they're not just withdrawn from uh, community life and not trust each other with higher um, uh, levels of violence, but they're frightened of each other. They barricade their houses with these fences, bars on windows, razor wire around uh, the fences. Uh, and just the same in South Africa, which of course has huge inequalities uh, for much the same reason. So the cost of inequality is you lose uh, that reciprocity, that community life and people's involvement in each other, the sort of public spiritedness. Uh, and you get this situation where people fear each other. Those wires at the top are, of course, an electric fence, and that notice that you can just about read says armed response. It's telling you you might get shot if you climb in. Um, so that is why I say one should see inequality as a social relationship not only between in, um, uh, superior and inferior, but changing our relationships to each other so we do fear each other. And that picture I've just given you is confirmed by uh, data from quite a different source. This is to American economists, and they again have shown this relationship internationally and for American states. It's, what it shows you is the proportion of the labor force in each country occupied in what they call guard labor. That means um, police, prison officers, uh, security staff goes up with inequality because those are the people in the labor force in a way we use to protect ourselves from each other. 
you know if you don't trust other people uh you lawyers are more important and uh uh, you do worry about not having enough police on the street and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if that is your experience of social relationships, your understanding uh, of how we are related to each other, of course it affects how you treat uh, international relations, what you think, um, uh, how you need to protect yourself from others. Um, inequality basically um, makes status and class um, matter more in our, our relationships. Um, <clears throat> and you can see how it affects uh, international relationships. Um, this is the Global Peace Index, um, measuring the sort of militarization of societies, uh, their involvement in, in conflict. Uh, use of armed police and so on. Um, and again, more inequality, uh, those societies do worse on the global peace index. They also do um, less well in terms of foreign aid. Um, in Britain, we've, uh, um, Boris Johnson has just decided to uh, cut um, uh, very substantially the amount we give in foreign aid just at the time when, of course, countries are having to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, when it comes to dealing with the environmental crisis, uh, surveys of business leaders' opinions, uh, they think of business leaders think international agreements and environmental issues are more important. Uh, uh, business leaders in more equal countries think they're more important. In more unequal countries, business leaders, I suspect, think it's not their job. Uh, it's for governments. Uh, their job is just to earn money. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so Again, you see these more unequal countries with those different social relationships within them, treating the rest of the world differently. Um, the more un unequal countries also emit more CO2 per $100 of, of income. Um, uh, you can look at other um, uh, other indications, of perhaps, of um, awareness of environmental issues. This is the amount that uh, people in different countries recycle different waste materials. I think it's five different uh, waste, waste materials, you know, like glass and paper and plastics and so on. Uh, and they recycle more in the more equal countries. Um, they use bicycles more um, as well. Um, so in all sorts of ways, I'm sorry, the last one of those uh, is about um, uh, consumerism. Um, because status becomes so important in more unequal countries, um, people in those more unequal places spend more on, on status consumption, um, uh, high status uh, cars and clothes with the right designer labels and all that sort of stuff. Um, so my conclusion, what I want to the sort of takeaway message is that we face a very clear choice between the policies of enlightened self-interest on those big five issues I pointed out at the beginning. Um, uh, to reduce the causes of conflict, um, which if we don't reduce those causes of conflict, uh, if we deal with them as politicians uh, uh, continue to do um, from the point of view of a very narrow short-term self-interest, uh, we will destroy our common well-being. Um, and that's true whether we're thinking of new pandemics uh, whether we're thinking of the environment, uh, whether we're thinking of uh, these issues of uh, 
uh, the rich uh, finding ways around taxation, uh, which means that our governments are less able to, to tackle those problems effectively. So I'll stop there. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you.